Hey guys, welcome back to the Magpet Ranch Paintball Channel and today I'm going to be doing another Final Inspect Fridays. But before we get into it guys, right, please subscribe to the channel, smash that like button, and of course turn on your notification bell. I'm posting content every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Uh, moving forward, I think I'm going to start posting some different content on Tuesday, Thursdays, and the weekends. Uh, but that being said guys, uh, go check out our library on our channel at Magpet Ranch Paintball. We have a lot of uh, content on there that is hopefully uh, helpful, give you guys tips and tricks on MagFed specific content uh, and some of the markers that we produce here. Uh, hopefully that'll help you guys if you guys have similar platforms. Also guys, of course, please like, watch the whole channel, this whole video, and then of course share and comment at the end. I try to respond to every comment, uh, whether that's a question or just a reaction, guys. Uh, and of course, share this content to the community because I think a huge part of uh, helping MagFed grow is going to be given everyone out there who's interested in playing MagFed, who's currently in MagFed, or you know maybe who's been playing around for a long time, uh, different, uh, hopefully helpful information, tips, tricks, that'll help you guys improve your MagFed experience, uh, help you guys decide on the different marker platforms, so forth and so forth. Okay, hey, so let's begin the video. Today's video, guys, I'm going to be looking, uh, going over a very breakdown of the 468 from MCS, or RAP4, uh, however you know them as. And so guys, today is going to be a very, just kind of a breakdown, objective look at the pros, cons, the different systems, uh, the different designs of the 468, and what I know about them. Uh, okay guys? And then of course, I have our M17 and our T15 as well here guys, not as a comparison video. This video is uh, not going to be like a direct comparison, but it's just to show you guys how different manufacturers uh, try to uh, tackle a goal using a different design or using a different means of, of, of uh, getting that that objective, right? Uh, getting that level of performance that they were trying to achieve with their platform. Okay, guys, uh, the 468, I have a lot of extensive knowledge real quick, background on it, because at one point, my team exclusively was using this, guys. I've, I've mentioned this on other videos, right, where uh, we are on this quest to continue improving our MagFed platforms. Uh, you know, we went from the T68, the conversion kits, to the 468 uh, uh, eventually. And then of course we transitioned to the, the mil SIGs uh, and so forth. Okay guys, so I have quite a bit of knowledge of tinkering with the 468. Our team put a lot of rounds through 468, both round ball and first strike rounds specifically a lot of first strike rounds at the very end uh, of our play time. So I have a lot of experience uh, with trying to get first strike rounds working with the 468. And so that's kind of, kind of the context of today's conversation and why I'm breaking it down for you guys. So that way I let you guys know out there who play with the 468 or maybe new buyers, new mag fetters that are looking to maybe purchase the 468, let you guys know the information and let you guys decide, you know, which, which route you want to take, right? Which mark you want to use, or if the 468 is right for you. I'm going to be, like I said, giving you guys the goods and the bads of it, okay? Um, also, real quick, as you guys know on this channel, I promote, obviously, first strike specifically, okay? So if a marker, uh, a MagFed marker, uh, it doesn't really work well with first strike rounds, I typically don't do content on it. But for today's uh, video, I'm going to uh, obviously kind of uh, go a little bit different directions just because, like I said, I'm going to give you guys as much information, pretty much all my knowledge, personal experience I've had with the 468 um, for you guys. Okay. All right. Let's begin. So as always, guys, I'm going to start from the tip to the butt of the marker and kind of break down each different design aspect. Uh, and then kind of show you guys some of the, the, the differences between the different markers, okay guys? So the 468 is, uh, you know, MCS's. Uh, this one is an early generation, guys. You guys can clearly see it still says RAP4 on it. So this was before, you know, they changed their name to MCS, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty much similar in design. Um, there have been a few, obviously, cosmetic iterations uh, throughout the years, but 
as far as I know, uh, looking at their current products uh, on MCS's website, it doesn't look like the designs have dramatically changed all that much. Okay guys, it's pretty much a blowback uh, spider design. Uh, you know, whereas like the, you know, the M17, it's got a heat core, the T15, I believe is an ICD blowback design that someone corrected me on. But anyways, guys, it's a blowback design. The barrel is going to be spider threaded, uh, like we said, just because it is a spider designed, uh, you know, initial uh, platform uh, marker, right? They took it from a spider design. The barrel nut on the 468, uh, real quick, because we're moving back to the handguard. It's going to be like an AR barrel nut. So the T15's barrel nut and the 468 barrel nut is gonna be very similar. So if you wanna use like different, different AR style hand guards, right? You can use it very similar to the T15. So that's really a good thing about the 468. It does follow uh, that aspect when it comes to the barrel nut. Uh, if you guys are planning to change barrels, obviously make sure you're getting a spider threaded one. Now, let's talk about a couple things uh, that's going to be kind of a common theme with the 468 as I keep moving back. And that is kind of the machine quality of the marker, guys. Uh, and like I said, this is a newer marker, and so uh, recent owners, right, uh, uh, players out there that's purchased recent iterations of the 468, please chime in on this video, see if things have changed. But one thing I noticed with RAP4 and MCS products, the machining isn't as good as some of the other markers, the T15 or the M17. Guys, this is, like I said, I'm going to be strictly objective about this. This is not me trying to diss on RAP4 or MCS. It's just the truth and that is uh, when you try to slide on some of the accessories for example the Picatinny rail uh, might not be as cut as closely uh, to mill spec as as you would like and so some of these are a little bit tight they're not going to fit on as nicely it's going to take a little bit more force uh, to fit on as well too um, kind of very similar to like you know uh, airsoft components where the machine quality might not be 100% there. That being said, it's functional, it works. As you guys can see, it fits really well once everything is put together. The reason for I wanted to say that though is kind of like start uh, how it's going to kind of relate to the rest of the receiver as we move back. And you'll notice here that the 468, even though it says that it patterns itself out of, off, uh, off of an AR uh, real steel rifle, right? You'll notice that it's more off of an AR-10. So the, you know, the bigger caliber AR family of rifles, right? And you can kind of see that it kind of resembles size-wise closer to the M17, right? You can see the receiver grip, height difference, thickness, right it resembles very close to the m17 and like i told you guys the m17 follows more of an ar10 platform okay so it's going to be like the bigger family of uh of the ar uh platform okay so go so just that being said guys just realize that you know the hand guards even though they'll work with off of an AR-15, the receiver being a little bit bigger, uh, it might not match up 100% depending on your handguard. It might sit a little bit lower, a little bit higher, just depending on the handguard design. And then the other thing about the, the 468 receiver is that even though it does follow more of a closely to an AR-10 pattern, its magazines, which are either the D-Mags or the Helix magazines, uh, and guys, I'm focusing on those specific magazines today, is because uh, although MCS at one point did offer different mag wells for the other magazines, like the Scarab Arm mags, or even the old school uh, T-68 mags, that uh, they don't primarily, you know, uh, uh, market 
the 468 and using those mags, right? So they primarily focus on the D mags or the Helix mags. And so that's what I'm gonna be focused on for you guys today. And then plus, um, obviously these mags were the mags that supposedly supposed to work with FSR. So we'll get that to, we'll get into that in a little bit here. Okay, but real quick, back to the size. So you'll see that even though the 468 is patterned out of an AR-10 uh, receiver, the magazines follow closer to an AR-15 magazine, right? And so you can see here the, the airsoft stands that I'm using to kind of showcase our markers here. You'll notice that the magwell does not fit the AR-10 magwell uh, as nicely as the Milsky. Uh, you'll, no, I'm sorry, the Valken M17, right? You'll notice that the Valken M17 fits right in, but the 468 does not. Whereas on the T15, because it follows closer to an actual AR-15 magazine well size, uh, the 468 does as well too. You see that? It slides in more closely. So in essence, it's kind of a, a hodgepodge of two different sizes and receivers, right? They're kind of using a magwell size of an AR-15, but then the receiver is more of a, an AR-10. So just be aware of that, guys, right? So when you guys go to buy vests, obviously the vests, uh, the chest rigs that are gonna work are gonna be the ones that are um, AR-15 size for the magazines. But in terms of, of achieving maybe a specific marker look that you guys are going for. Uh, it's gonna resemble more of an AR-10 look than an actual AR-15 look, okay? The other things too is guys, is as much as the 468 is touted as a kind of a one-to-one -one, uh, replica of an AR uh, receiver, you guys will notice that it's it's got a lot of, for lack of better words, flaws when it comes to that aspect. The magazine release, I'll start first, right? You'll notice that it's kind of like a Z pattern on this side. And so even though, right, even though uh, it functions in essence similar to like an AR magazine release here, uh, it doesn't resemble exactly like the real AR design. Whereas the T15, right, resembles closer to that actual design, right? It looks pretty much exactly like a real AR magazine release button. Uh, and then you'll also notice that it has, the T15, it has a non-functional bolt release because obviously markers don't have a bolt in, this, in the same sense as a real firearm. But the 468, you'll notice, does not have anything there. It's, it's just empty. So it doesn't 100%. You can also notice the shape of the magwell as well too. It doesn't really resemble a real AR uh, magwell shape. And it just looks a little bit bigger and thicker. Um, you guys have to kind of remember the origin history of the 468. It was an evolution, of course, of RAP4s and MCS's products, right? Which they originally started more similar to what like the mil sig design was with the bigger magwell as you can see here so even though you know they went away from the powder release which i like right that it resembles more of an ar push button uh release they kind of kept the same dimensions uh of their older markers right the t68 uh the mil sig designs okay and then you also notice here too that they did try to make a provision for some type of um, uh, dust cover flap, like a real AR would have, like on our T15 here. But they didn't really go and finish it because obviously it's, it's unnecessary, like you really don't need it, it would be just for show. I like the fact that they didn't try to market it as a hopper fed marker. Okay guys? Um, and that's also where the detents are held in as well too. You guys can see where the detents, they got two detents on both sides. I do like that design in general with paintball markers, having a dual detent uh, design versus the M17's 
uh, single detent. Now granted, you know, if the detent is new and still stiff, uh, you don't really run into many uh, double feeding issues or, you know, obviously just feeding issues. But when the detents do get weak, having a double detent system like the uh, 468 or the T15, I think is a better, better design. Okay. Uh, keep going on with the receivers. Some of the differences uh, with the 468 uh, design uh, of a real versus a real AR, you'll notice that the push pins are in different locations, right? So the front one is fairly accurate, right? It's kind of at the very end of the bottom uh, lower receiver. But you'll notice that the rear one is up at the high point, almost kind of in the middle of where the ASA uh, was screwed into. And guys, that is inaccurate. A real AR is going to be more closely uh, resembling a T15. Okay, you'll notice that the buttons are on both, uh, on lower, on the lower receiver, and they're at kind of rear, uh, the rear one is uh, near the selector switch, which is where it's supposed to be. Uh, like I said, if, you know, if your whole marketing thing is that, you know, you're resembling a real AR, there's definitely some difference there, noticeable differences, uh, that makes it not so, okay? Now, in terms of disassembly, right? It disassembles the same, right? It tilts forward. We'll get into this little pin next here, guys, okay? The bolt comes out just like any standard uh, bolt uh, will, like on the T15 as well, okay? And the upper and lower receivers disconnect like a real AR in that respect. So in that respect, yes, it, it's, it's similar, but once again, not really one-to-one -one as closely as a T15. Now that being said, obviously it's a lot closer than the Valkins design, right? Where the Valkin is still using the old school Milsig design where you have a bunch of receiver screws, two plastic halves, and of course the heat core system where it doesn't, uh, you know, there's no halves to uh, separate. It literally just pulls the whole heat core from the back of the receiver. Okay, let's talk about some of the internal designs, uh, internal components of the RAP4 or MCS468. Now, I'm still using the older generation uh, bolt, and it was the plastic design bolt. I know they had gone to the Javelin design, and supposedly it was supposed to be, you know, uh, more reliable, uh, you know, uh, I guess less less issues uh, with those types of things, maybe more efficient, but one of the things that was touted with this particular bolt was that it was supposed to work well with FSR, okay? And as you guys know, I was the armorer on our team, and my whole goal was trying to improve our capability, our, our loadouts, right? Make it more efficient, make it more reliable, really is the, the, one of the key things as well. And so we were on this pursuit to make it work with first strike rounds, our, our MagFed markers. Whether that was the conversion kits, whether that was the T68, whether that was the, uh, you know, our 468s, I was on this pursuit mission to try to get our markers FSR capable uh, reliable and better performing, okay? And so this was one of the components that we had changed out to. You, you do notice that they kind of serrated the bolt here, and that is for, supposed to be, uh, you know, to help, kind of like how uh, real ARs have um, grooves in their bolts. It's supposed to prevent, like, clogging of the paint, if there was paint breakages in there, dirt, dust, or whatever. So uh, that was kind of a unique, uh, cool concept. Ultimately, it didn't really matter that much because most of the paint breaks were in the front part of the chamber here. So, you know, this serration really, uh, I, we didn't really notice it helping or not helping, but it was a cool concept and design. Uh, the other thing too, uh, you'll notice that there's a cutout in the upper receiver of the 468 for our first strike round. And that was kind of a, obviously a newer thing when they switched to the 468. Um, guys, you have to remember this was uh, about a decade ago and the FSR was really not a thing yet. And 
round ball was still a thing and we were still they were you know we were still trying to get our markers to work well with round ball and so concepts like this was fairly cutting edge uh, you know to make markers that are going to be FSR capable the only problem with this if you guys can just kind of see off the top of the bat though is that it's a perfect shape of a first strike round okay guys so like as I told you guys the problem with first strike rounds is that it has a lot of sharp edges to catch and from pictures online of recent designs of the 468 I have not seen them change this design, this cutout. And so what that means is that it, because you have a sharp edge here, and with the sharp edge of the uh, FSR round, there's a potential for it to catch. You know, I, I kind of stated this on my uh, review video of the Sconey Killhouse uh, TIPX breach. And it's very similar. So because there's no kind of beveling, there's no ramping of that cutout, the chances of the first strike round uh, catching is going to be higher. So this is definitely an issue on where the FSR can be uh, cause an issue, okay? Uh, there's also, you can see, if you look inside here, you also see the lock bolt mechanism. So that little swing lever, that spring loaded, uh, that when a round goes up into the chamber, if it seats in all the way, then it'll allow the bolt to come forward. Uh, if not, then it's going to, like I said there, I kind of just demonstrated it, but it's going to prevent the bolt from going all the way forward. Right here, see, see how it stops, bam, bam. But if I press it all the way in, now you can see the bolt go all the way in. You see that, okay? So now the bolt will go all the way through to fire versus if the lock bolt is engaged, right? It prevents that bolt from coming forward. And then all you hear is a click. So like I said, really cool concept, a really cool idea from MCS. You know, um, once again, with round ball, that's a huge uh, technology improvement. So kudos to them on that. Like I told you guys, things that work well, things that don't work well, I'll let you guys know. But this is the problem with that design because it's just adding one more component that can go wrong uh, it will go wrong okay so it's great a lot of these theories a lot of these designs work really well in testing in ideal conditions right like just at your lab at your range you know, with no dirt involved, with no other uh, uh, maybe environmental issues involved. But under, you know, those conditions, maybe harsher conditions, uh, that system doesn't work too well. So to say that this prevented every break, guys, is false, okay? Uh, our team had plenty times in the field where I had to take our markers apart or maybe, down, you know, in between games, uh, fix this issue and one of the huge issues that the lock bolt has is if it does not prevent the break and somehow there's still a break in here which I told you guys it, it still happened that that whole system gets gummed up with paint okay and it is a pain in the butt to clean up because there's all these little small components in there there's a little spring in there uh, it uses little small Allen keys, okay? So that way, you know, a little small screw, little small hardware. And so if you don't have those tools, and then of course, if you just don't know how to actually work on them, you can run into a lot of issues and that could cause your marker to, be, uh, to go down because if that thing gets clogged up, there's a possible chance that even with the round loading into the chamber, correctly, it won't allow the lock bolt mechanism to go up because there's paint, there's gunk, there's dirt. Uh, as you guys can see here on this side, look, there's a huge hole in that area. So you can imagine dirt, debris, whatever getting in there. And if it gums up that control mechanism, it's going to prevent the, 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 the gun from firing. 
and now you're having to disassemble all of that, clean it out. And at a field where you know you don't have an air blow gun, you don't have all your freaking cleaning equipment, that can literally take your marker out of commission. So, you know, the concept of KISS, right, keep it, uh, keep it simple, stupid, I think is a better idea. And so going in with, you know, the M17 or the T15 platforms, you know, they have, they have nothing like that, right? They literally just have an empty chamber, detent, uh, and a good magazine and good magwell design and a good chamber cutout design to facilitate good feeding, especially with the first strike round. Okay, uh, I've made videos about this with the T15, but you'll, uh, on the cutout, the FSR cutout on the T15's uh, uh, receiver here, it's ramped. So that way there's no uh, uh, less likely chance of the first strike round catching and flipping. Okay, so just less things to go wrong. So great concept with the lock bolt, works decently well with round ball, but it's not 100% perfect. You're going to have failures. And when it does fail, it can really F, F the system up. Now, when it comes to FSR, don't use it. It's just one more thing to catch the FSR. It's one more thing to go wrong with the FSR. If you guys are planning to use FSR with, a, with any marker, try to keep the design simple and more of the shape, the cutout, the beveling, the group, the angle at which the first strike round is coming in. And we'll get into that with uh, you know magazine designs as well too. That's gonna ensure better FSR reliability. The 468, once again, you guys out there obviously comment, but I do not, I repeat, I do not recommend it with first strike rounds. And this is one of the reasons why. The other reason why, too, guys, is, of course, the lower receiver design, okay? So, on this particular gun, uh, or marker, I apologize, I also have the anti-drop device. This was a new concept that was introduced uh, around the time that my team and I were playing. And, of course, we got one of the very first, uh, you know, this, uh, production runs of them. And once again, I don't think it's changed much. It works really well. It's, it's, it's well built, it's well designed. But in essence, it's, it's kind of a dual spring-loaded catch system where uh, the magazine has to be inserted fully for the FS cutout to uh, line up properly, right? So in its uh, unloaded magazine state, it's kind of down like this, and the FSR cutout is not straight up and down, so uh, the round won't blow properly. Once the magazine is inserted, you'll notice that it pushes that plate up, and now it's lined up perfectly, quote unquote perfectly, with the magazine and the follower and everything like that to, right, to push the first strike round up or paintballs up, okay? And that idea, that, that, that design idea was to prevent the whole dropping or losing of rounds uh, when you go to do a, um, a, a tactical reload, right? So not an emergency reload, right? Not a reload where bam, 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 you know, you run your marker dry and now you have to go make, you know, an emergency reload uh, to, to get uh, fresh rounds into the marker. This is more like, okay, cool, I just got done with an engagement. I have maybe three or four rounds left on that stack of the DMAG. I want to load a fresh stack, so now I have a fresh seven or 10 rounds, so that way I'm ready for the next engagement, right? And then I can put my other magazine into my, uh, my magazine pouch. Uh, that design, prevented the rounds from dropping out of the magazine and losing, you know, you're losing two or three rounds. And think about it, I mean, cool, cool, super concept, right? I mean, you don't want to lose rounds out on the battlefield in, during gameplay, right? One or two rounds in a uh, limited capacity uh, type of gameplay can make the difference. And then also, if you were playing with first strike rounds, you know, that's a dollar, right? I mean, if each round is 40 cents, 50 cents, and you lose two rounds, that could be a dollar worth of, worth of uh, ammo that you're losing. So 
really cool concept in design and theory, but once again, right? Keep it simple, stupid. So the problem is, it's one more thing to go wrong. It's one more thing to catch the first strike rounds. It's one more thing to get gummed up with round ball if there was a break in there. Obviously with first strike rounds, right? It's just another lip edge to catch on to because once again, they did not bevel. They did not groove, you know, make the, the, the surfaces smooth to facilitate first strike reloading. So once again, if it's for first strike usage, don't use a 468. That's just my my recommendation. You guys out there, you know, who's you know tried it with first strike rounds, and you guys have comments, please comment. But this thing, I never was able to get it to work with first strike rounds. Now with round ball, it did do okay. But once again, when there was a break, and guys, there was, uh, even with all these different you know uh, anti-breaking uh, devices. It's just one more component to gum up. It's one more component to take apart and clean out. Um, one more component to lose, right? One more thing to go wrong, okay? Uh, and once again, if you compare that to the other markers, the other markers don't have anything like that. So yes, you lose that function of losing one or two rounds, but the reliability issue, right? I will tell you guys this. From my own and from my own team's experience, we preferred the simplicity. Okay, hey, you lose one or two rounds during a tactical reload, but my gun worked better or more often than not, right? Or it worked all the time versus having an issue, right? The gun going bang, right? The marker going bang more, you know, more reliably is more important than not losing one or two rounds. Okay, that's that's my opinion on that. Not matter. Okay. Now, as I told you guys too, it was it was kind of cool, right? They did make different uh, magazine wells that you could replace. And to do that, you literally just uh, remove that pin right there that held in the de uh, the anti drop device. I'll show you guys here, right? Uh, and then literally, you could just slide the magazine well off. Uh, right, and then replace it with different magazine wells. Uh, you would need to change this little front piece as well here too on the lower receiver. As you know, this is the uh, the detent to push the D mag right to release the magazines uh, stack. Right, so if you're switching it to a different magazine, uh, they would give you a new piece for that as well. Okay, so just FYI with that, guys. Okay. Okay, drop this back in for you guys. And then just make sure when you guys do do it, like I said, it's just, you know, it's, you've done it a few times. I haven't done it in a while, guys, but you do it a few, time, a few times, not that difficult to do. Uh, but once again, it's just one more thing to go wrong out on the field, right? I, I just personally prefer, right? Right, I just personally prefer, you know, simplicity, okay? All right. So moving back, another couple of things uh, that I personally didn't like as the armor, right? And as you know, obviously, you know, having to deal with it for my team is the little gasket here that they use to seal the upper and lower receiver, right? So obviously in a blowback design, guys, what happens is when the, you press the trigger and the spring uh, that's obviously uh, holding your lower uh, air chamber back, right? it's gonna go shoot forward with the spring pressure in here. And when that happens, it's going to, uh, the bolt is going to come forward and it's going to push down, uh, it's going to, I'm sorry, it's going to align up, right? It's going to open up the air valve chamber here and then it's going to line up with the bolt, uh, the cutout in the bolt in the upper receiver. And that's how the air that's stored in the lower receiver is going to shoot out of the bolt, right? Because once everything's lined up. Well, there has to be obviously a gasket that seals those two halves together. But what I didn't like about the 468 design is you notice here that it's literally just glued on. Now, when we first got these things, they weren't very held on with a very strong glue. You'll notice here that I put on a very uh, uh, stronger, stickier glue to prevent losing that gasket. 
And guys, we lost the gasket a lot. And it's a combination of obviously the 468 not being that reliable, but also because of that design of where literally it's just held in by, for glue, for back of battle words. And so uh, this is just a small sample of every little kind of maintenance kit that you know we gave each team member. But you'll notice that uh, I have you know one of those gaskets in in this uh, repair kit maintenance kit. But I'll be honest with you guys, I bought hundreds of those little gaskets, and we always brought you know hundreds with us wherever we went to play because it was. 100% we're going to lose three to four to five every game, especially in a team of five or six players, right? You're going to lose one or two because your 468 would go down. You would have to take it apart to try to obviously maintenance it, clean it out specifically. And of course, when the marker was aired up and you go to separate the upper and lower receiver, the air is going to shoot out of this thing. Okay? And so that's where you would lose... Uh, that uh, lose that gasket, okay? The other thing too is this little pin right here. This pin right here, I'll be honest with you guys, was just a bad design flaw, design issue with the 468. One, you'll notice that it's not attached to the lower receivers, uh, the air chamber, if you wanna call it bolt or air chamber uh, assembly, right? It's literally just kind of sat, sits in place there with a cutout that's built into the air chamber assembly, okay? And so what happens is at times, right, if you're not careful, you go to disassemble your marker, this thing will drop out. And it's very small, as you can see, right? Super small. And what this, what this little, uh, uh, I guess, if you want to call it, pin did, was that it obviously married the air chamber on the lower receiver and the bolt in the upper receiver together, right? So that way when they go back and forth, they're connected together, okay? But like I was telling you guys, one, you could definitely lose this when you go to separate and clean the marker, but also two, these would bend after a certain amount of rounds of firing. Um, we didn't, unfortunately, I didn't do a very good job of round counting how many rounds we went through before we had to replace these. But I'll be honest with you guys, we replaced these often, frequently, right? Like maybe every four or five games, we would have to replace this. And so if you can imagine, I mean, you don't, it's not like speedball. We're not shooting thousands of rounds every match. We're maybe shooting, you know, 50 or 60 rounds every match in our loadout. And you're having to change this after four or five matches. That's only a few hundred rounds before having to change this pin. And I have an original one here. You can see it's kind of shiny in color versus uh, ones that were made by uh, MCS later uh, that were more durable that were this, uh, you know, they were oxide, they were black in color, and they were supposed to be uh, stronger uh, and less bendable. And so yes, as part of our maintenance kits, we, we carried a lot of these as well, right? I would bring, like I was telling you guys, the gaskets, this pin, I would bring hundreds of them to every, you know, every event or every match we went to because, you know, we didn't know if we were gonna lose one or if they were gonna bend. And what happens is when it bends, guys, is that, think about it, now if it bends, the bolt is gonna be no longer held by the air chamber receiver. And so when you go shoot it, it's literally just gonna disconnect, right? And so your, your marker might not fire, uh, it might just get jammed up because now it's slightly bent. Or the other thing too is that it's not going to uh, retract all the way because the bolt is bent and so now your bolt is in the wrong position which could cause other issues like jams right because remember your bolt has to sit properly in the upper receiver for the next round to come up and if it's bent and now it's not coming all the way back right it's not going to 
uh, cock, re-cock all the way back properly. And so a lot of issues we ran into as well as with this pin and then with that gasket as well. Okay. And then the other crappy thing sometimes too is that sometimes what would happen, and guys, I'm, I'm trying to give you guys all the little different things that we ran into. So hopefully this will help 468 users out there or at least help you guys, you know, know more about the 468 and make your decision. But sometimes what would happen would be that cutout would rotate out of place. And so now you just got to make sure you have some type of, you know, um, some type of tool so that way you can turn it back into place. Because you got to remember, this was under spring, uh, spring tension. Remember? Okay. All right. Um, going to the, uh, the back of the marker here more. Oh, real quick. Uh, another thing about the receiver, and like I said, guys, you kind of start seeing these things as a common theme with the 468 design. And it's just kind of poor machine quality and poor workmanship. Okay, guys? Um, this is, like I said, this is just giving you guys information. You use it for what it's worth. Okay, but you'll notice that the 468 has another feature here that's not AR standard, right? Like it has a quick disconnect fitting here on both sides so that you can attach some type of QD mount, QD sling mount, or a similar accessory. Great idea in concept. Great, you know, right? Great, great, you know, that's cool. That's, that, that seems like a smart idea. But once again, the execution of it is poor. So you'll see here that I have a QD mount that I've taken off of my real steel uh, rifle and it snaps in, but I can literally pull it right back out. Okay, and so it's like they didn't machine the QD receiver accurately. And so the ball bearings that are supposed to retain this mount doesn't work. And so you can imagine, right, you're rocking your marker with the sling, you know, you're running around, something tugs on it, and the whole thing comes out, and now your marker literally falls down to the ground, right? And so that's why we never rocked our slings there. So just FYI, you know, it seems cool like you got a sling mount there, but that's the reason why we never rocked our, our sling mounts in that rear position, okay? So just kind of another machine uh, issue. Uh, moving back further, uh, oh, before I get into moving back further, uh, this is a standard 468, guys. This is not the PTR, right? The professional training rifle. Right? And you'll notice that the selector switch is not very realistic uh, compared to a real AR uh, uh, rifle, right? You'll notice that it's kind of offset in the wrong position. And then you'll notice that this is fire, this is safe. And then you'll also notice that it's very notchy. There's not a clear position from safe to fire. And so, even though it looks kind of real, right? right? You'll notice it here with the T15, it has a similar look in terms of the switch, but the T15 actually has the correct positions and it'll click into those positions. Although, not that great. I've talked about this on my, you know, things I like, dislike about the T15. The, the positioning is not that great. Okay, like you don't really feel like solid click. The PTR fixed that issue, right? The PTR, if you look at pictures of the PTR's lower receiver, you'll notice that it has more of the realistic um, uh, selector switch. But, you know, once again, just kind of like, well, you know, the 468, you're gonna have to pay more money, you gotta upgrade to the PTR to get that feature. Whereas, you know, the T15 kind of comes with that. And then, of course, the M17 comes with that as well. And I told you guys I really love the M17 design because this feature is really positive. It really clicks into place, right? It has a very solid, positive, well-made uh, feel to it versus the T15 or the 468, okay? And then you also notice that it's not ambidextrous, right? Compared to the other markers, the other, uh, the M17 has an ambidextrous, the T15 does not as well. So things to be aware of, 
Obviously the T15 doesn't come with full auto. That's an upgrade of, you know, like another $250, $300 upgrade. Whereas the M17 has that uh, full auto capability already stock. Okay. Things to consider. All right. Uh, going back, let's talk about how the air stock and air design is uh, attached to the receiver. And guys, one thing I didn't really like about the 468 as well too is how the guide rod and the buttstock and the air tank uh, assembly is attached to the marker. And you'll notice here that it uses a guide rod very similar looking to the M17 or you know on a factory T15 now they've switched to just a sticker design right? Where you would attach a sticker, right, with the built-in kind of guide rod adjustments to the T15, and then it would just slide onto the buttstock of the T15, right? And then you would just screw it into the back of the T15 as such. Guys, this is a 17 CI tank. It's a little bit long, but you guys get the kind of get the concept, right? But the old school T15s had a similar guide rod set up to the M17 where you would screw it into the rear of the ASA, right, adapter. So the M, uh, I'm sorry, the 468 had something similar, but the way they mounted it was a, in my mind, a poor, poor, you know, a lesser design. Because all it did was it had kind of this push button um, click uh, receiver that just pretty much just kind of held it in place with a little tooth here. So that way it, it won't pull out. Okay, so then obviously you would go and screw your tank in, right? You would have to go screw your tank in to the back of the 468. You would go attach a little guide rod. And you would have to make sure that it's lined up right because if anything is in the way, it's not going to sit properly. That clip that holds the buttstock on, right? So you can imagine your buttstock is here, right? And it's on the guide rod. It looks, everything looks hunky-dory. But the problem is if that button got accidentally pushed, and once again, guys, you know, in real life, under real playing conditions, you know, it's, it's not like a test range. It's not like just a test, a, a test laboratory. This button somehow is going to get pushed, whether that's maybe with your gear on your vest, or maybe, you know, like you're hitting something when you're diving around or digging, you know, like crawling around. And what can happen is literally this whole guide rod will come out just like that, and literally your whole stock will slide off. And so if you can imagine, once again, this is the reason why I recommend to you guys not to attach your swing points right, not to attach your sling points onto your buttstock, you know, whether that's an M17 or whether that's a freaking T15 because there's always that possible chance of that happening. But this was more so with the 468 design because now it's literally the guide rod that is coming off versus just the buttstock sliding off with these other markers. Right, so because the guide rods on the other markers were screwed in, uh, whereas the 468 wasn't, if that button was accidentally depressed, the whole buttstock would literally slide off. Okay, and so just another thing to go wrong out in the field. And guys, I'm telling you guys all this because these things did go wrong out in the field for my teammates and I. Okay, now don't get me wrong, I don't prefer the sticker design either. Uh, obviously the sticker is just a sticker. It can, you know, heat conditions, it can obviously, and just through time, it's going to wear off and then it's gonna have that same thing, right? Where it's gonna just slide off of uh, the tank. Okay? But that's why I always recommend to you guys uh, use some type of rear sling attachment, uh, like that little key chain loop here that the M17 comes with or, uh, you know, like on our, on our builds, right, on all our uh, T15 builds, we include a, you know, a first strike rear sling mount 
that you can attach to there so that way you bypass the butt stock completely and just attach it here and then use like some type of picatinny mount uh, with a quick disconnect or something like that or even a loop to attach the sling mount in the front okay uh, so that being said I uh, you know 468 uh, MCS came up with a new design a different design to mount the guide rod uh, and instead of using this push button style, they had kind of like this clamp style that ran around the tank like this. But, once again, kind of a, uh, a fix, right? Kind of a band-aid fix to a known problem. And that did help, guys, don't get me wrong, but then now it's kind of like, uh, it wasn't, it's something extra that you have to purchase now versus uh, using uh, a good design that should have came with the marker, right? And, and guys, I get it. All these markers have gone through iterations at one point, right? Whether that was the receiver design, uh, the cutouts, uh, the ramping beveling of the cutout on the FSR, like the T15, and even the M17 went through that. Uh, barrel wobble design on the T15, right? But uh, to me, those were like, hard improvements that these other manufacturers took, whereas MCS seemed to always kind of band-aid the fix, right? Come out with a solution. Now, to their credit, they tried to come up with a solution, but I feel like their execution, and that's the key right here, is always it seems like their execution is lacking. Take it for what it's worth, guys. I never was able to get it to work with first strike rounds. Okay. Now going back, uh, why I would prefer, this is the reason why I, on my 468, you'll notice that I have an air through stock versus the air tank stock, right? In tank stock, for that reason, because now you're bypassing the guide rod, you're not having to deal with the guide rod issue, right? It's just more positive. Uh, although like this little lock nut design here, I never really personally like because this thing does come loose and it will shift on you during gameplay, but at least it was better than the whole guide rod uh, butt stock falling off. And then plus, it does give you a lower cheek weld compared to the in-tank design, so that way you don't have to use as uh, high of a riser. So there are some benefits, and then of course, you know, more air, right, with the remote line. Guys, anyways, go check out that video where I talked about that, right, there's pros and cons to each system. Okay. Uh, let's go into how the 468 velocity adjustment was made. And that was another issue I have with the 468 is that how you adjust the velocity on it. So on the M17, on the T15, right, the velocity adjustment is just a turning of the Allen key, right? On the 4, uh, M17, it's on the bottom here, right? It tells you which direction to go. On the T15, it's this little Allen key on the side. Uh, lefty is increasing the feet, feet per second. So righty, tighty is actually decreasing the feet per second. Lefty, loosey is actually increasing the velocity, which makes sense when you look inside the design of the markers, right? It's literally opening up that chamber more when you loosen it or closing that chamber more uh, when you're turning it tight on the T15. Ooh, the other thing I wanted to show you guys on the T15 versus the uh, 468 that I prefer uh, but you'll notice that instead of using that gasket design the glued gasket design on the 468 the T15 uh, uses this o-ring upper and lower manifold design and so there's less likely chances of that thing uh, losing that o-ring uh, I've never lost an o-ring from my T15s yet uh, that being said, there's always that chance so again, so definitely have some more of these O-rings available, but definitely a better design than the glued O-ring, okay guys? And then you'll notice here too that uh, the upper and lower bolts are just held in by a sear, a trigger sear, literally like a real AR, right? And when you go to press uh, the trigger, it obviously lowers uh, the sear to release the bolt. Uh, versus an internal mechanism and then you have to have that pin that can either bend and get damaged or you can lose it out on the field uh, releasing the, uh, the bolt. Okay guys, so I feel the T15 is superior to 
the 468 in that regard. Okay? Now going back to how you adjust the velocity. So one thing I really disliked about the velocity adjustment on the 468 is that to adjust the velocity, you gotta unscrew your air tank, right? Or your air source. So imagine your air tank, you know, your air through tank is here. Uh, and then of course, if you had an air tank on here, right? It's blocking the rear velocity adjustment spring, okay? Where you would go to adjust your velocity. And on the 468, it was a combination of springs getting a stiffer spring or looser spring to adjust your velocity. And then also there was a small adjustment that you could make by turning the spring seat, as you can see here, this kind of this guide rod for the spring is threaded and you can kind of screw it in and out to kind of fine tune uh, how much FPS you had with the different springs. Okay, but like I said, it was a very pain in the butt because every time you go to fire your marker and adjust the velocity, you have to go unscrew your tank or, or disconnect your air source and then unscrew your air through to, uh, stock to get it to work, okay? All right, there's a couple of kind of bumper cushions in here as well too, which is, which is common. There's always gonna be some type of bumper cushion for the spring, just like on the T15 or even on the heat core design. Okay, but the other thing that I really disliked about the 468 guys, and this was very true on all our 468s, is on the lower half of the receiver here, I'm gonna have to just take it, uh, uh, disassemble for it to show you guys, but uh, I'll post pictures of it on this video, is that the grooves on the back of the receiver, that this pin, you'll notice the pin on that, uh, 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 right, the velocity adjustment assembly, goes into what can happen is because literally it's like an l-shaped groove right you're literally going and right you're sliding the adjustment uh, spring in and then you're pushing it into this groove and then turning it to hold right so you're literally having to push in and rotate, you can kind of see where the slot is on the back of the 468. You can imagine, well you can't, you don't even need to imagine, I'll tell you, is that over time as this air chamber is bouncing back and forth every time you're firing it, it puts pressure on that groove cutout. And because of that groove cutout being very thin, right, they literally just cut this L-shaped groove onto the lower receiver and it has like a little ear, right? And now you're having this chamber bounce back and forth and banging up against it. High count, high round count 468s, that receiver will bend. That, that rear part of the receiver will bend and now effectively pretty much causing a useless receiver, right? Because now that ear is literally bent back or it'll break sometimes on some of our really high count four, six, eights on our teams, it would break. We've had to replace a few lower receivers in our team's uh, uh, armory because of that, right? And once again, guys, it's not like we're shooting, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of rounds. Now, don't get me wrong, our team shot thousands of rounds through our four, six, eight, uh, and probably we shot, uh, you know, maybe a couple thousand rounds before that happened. But, you know, you guys can imagine that's supposed to be a thing that you would think would last a little bit longer, but you know, only after you know a few games or a few tournaments, uh, you're having to go replace your lower receiver, and these lower receivers aren't cheap, and you know, uh, MCS didn't warranty them, right? Because they were they were damaged receivers. Um, you know, they made you buy all these spare parts. Not not saying that. Hey, you guys can have your opinions. I personally think they should have changed to a different design so that way it's not damaging. I personally think, you know, uh, they should obviously, you know, come up with a better design so you're not having to have bent pins and losing pins, but once again, it's just something that, you know, it was a flawed design. You know, whereas the heat core T15, uh, you're not running into those issues, uh, wear issues like that. Don't get me wrong, there's, you know, every mechanical device is gonna wear. 
It's just that these things seem to wear a lot faster. And then like I said too, the velocity adjustment, besides being a pain in the butt, uh, they're not as consistent as the other designs, right? The T15 is not as consistent as the M17, but we're still saying a below plus or minus 10, right? Uh, T15s usually hover right around plus or minus eight feet per second, which isn't bad for a blowback design. Uh, the M17's heat uh, core, you know, below four design is closer to plus or minus five or six. So more consistent design, better accuracy, better reliability, uh, those type of things. Okay, guys? Uh, I wanted to save, I guess, what you want to say, the best for last. And what that is, guys, is going to be uh, the magazine designs of the different markers, but specifically uh, going over the 468's uh, M17 designs. Okay, guys? So, like I was telling you guys, uh, I wanted to save the best for last, and that is the magazine design of each uh, different marker. And why, really, when it comes to MagFed, guys, we really need to just focus on the magazine first and foremost. Regardless of what company you are, regardless of what marker you're trying to make, the primary start should be the magazine. And then also, of course, you know, what round are you planning to shoot out of the said magazine, right? If you're going to shoot round ball out of the magazine and that's all you're designing the marker for, like let's say the TMC, the Stormer, uh, even the Takamo, you know, the conversion kits to an extent, then you have to put, you don't have to put as much thought into it, okay? But when you start talking about, well, hey, I want you to be able to use first strikes with it, I want it to be compatible, reliable with first strikes, then we really have to start looking into how the magazine works, functions, and its features, okay? So that's what I'm gonna discuss today, uh, well, at the end of this video here put all these things back real quick and the issue with the 468 is the DMAGS design right a little bit of history you guys have to realize where kind of the DMAG concept kind of came from right and I'm sure you know MAGFED historians the companies themselves have more of a you know a better history uh, description of it but you got to remember that you know, when the first MagFed game uh, markers came out, they were designed for round ball. You know, first strike rounds weren't a thing yet until, you know, Tiberius Arms, formerly, you know, before they were known as first strike, uh, introduced the round and introduced their line of markers that were able to fire those rounds, right? Round ball was the thing. And so, you know, the old mill sig designs that MCS, RAP4 was kind of emulating, uh, you know, the round collar, right? You guys remember those round collar mill sigs? Uh, those were the designs that were used for round ball play. And so they were still expensive, right? You're talking about, you know, early 2000s here, guys. And these magazines were 20 to $30 at that time. And then of course, you know, uh, when First Strike started becoming introducing and then they started making specific First Strike round magazines, they were slightly more than the regular round ball magazines, right? Because everyone was going, ooh, you know, First Strike rounds, I want my marker to be able to, to take the, the FS rounds for better performance. And so those magazines were more expensive, uh, even more so. And so the round ball was the goal, right, to make sure uh, the magazine, uh, the markers were reliable with round ball, but they also wanted to be able to have the dual capability to shoot first strike rounds. And so that's kind of where the concept of the D-Mag came from. They wanted to be able to give MagFed players, and like I said, the intention was great, guys. Love them for the intention, right? The intention was to produce a low-cost magazine, right, because these things were, I think, $15 a magazine versus the $30. So we're talking, you know, half the price of what a Scarab Arms magazine would cost or what, you know, the earlier generation Milsig first strike magazines would cost, right? 
uh, and then even you know the first early generation T15 magazines would cost. Um, it was a affordable, uh, you know, durable, right, round ball capable magazine. Uh, reliable with round ball. That's the thing too, guys. The D mags and the helix mags are reliable with round ball. And so if you know if you lost one of these in a tournament or in a big field or whatever, okay, hey, I lost 15 bucks versus $30, right? And then it's reliable with round ball. And hey, we can try to get it to work with first strike rounds, okay? But therein lies the problem, okay? Is that they designed it initially to work with round ball, unlike potentially some of the other magazine markers, right? Like the M17, especially the later generations of M17, the later generations of T15, uh, the EMF, for example, right? If you, if you read their marketing, it says that they spent thousands of rounds and countless hours, right? High-speed cameras with, you know, uh, marker cutouts to see how the first strike rounds were loading to design uh, the EMF magazines. And that's what makes them so reliable with first strike round. But you have to remember the D-Mags were designed as round ball as the primary uh, ammunition. And then D-Mags as potential, uh, I'm sorry, first strike as, as a potential secondary ammunition. And then also cost, okay? And so the springs that they had put into the D-Mags was springs to not only use with round ball, but their intention was to use it for inconsistent round balls on top of that right because like i told you guys this time manufacturer paintball manufacturers really weren't coming up with magazine specific paintballs right so we we're having to just use what paintballs were available in the market some were dimpled some were oval some were not the correct sizing and so some of those didn't work really well with a collar design magazine Right, so if you can imagine most of the magazines, right, has some type of collar insert and has the cutout shape. And so if the cutout shape was not perfectly sized to your paintball, you can see where all the issues, uh, feeding issues came about with uh, these magazines. The T15 kind of eliminated that by eliminating a collar design, right? They literally just have an open chamber with a spring, you know, a follower uh, with spring loaded that just pushes it out. So there's nothing for it to potentially jam. But if you can imagine the old school Milsig magazines, right, where it has a round collar, and if that round cutout was not perfect and the paintball didn't feed up there perfectly, it could cause all these issues. And so the DMAG was a way to kind of eliminate that issue. And so they used very, uh, you know, a softer spring to compensate for all those different shaped round balls, right? It was enough spring pressure to feed the, uh, the round into the chamber, but not enough to, to, to dent the paintball or potentially, you know, make it oblong, okay? But the problem with that is they ran into an issue when it became trying to use with first strike rounds because first strike rounds, one, they're a harder shell, right? They're kind of this polyester lean shell so they don't dimple uh, but also because the first strike rounds uh, they can catch and also uh, if they don't uh, if they if they don't have enough spring pressure to push them up into the chamber and they accidentally catch right you might not have enough spring pressure to push it up through the magazine and so it can jam up the magazine if it catches somewhere inside the magazine with a weak spring pressure or you know let's say it catches into the early designed collar mag uh things right i told you guys in other videos about the Gryzen magazine and of course the old school m17 magazines where the collars that's the issue with these magazines right they have rough edges rough textures inside the collars and that's what causes the first strike rounds to to jam or potentially flip and so they kind of, one of their concepts, right, one of their ideas, here, I, I actually kind of just got the magazine to do it right now. I'll try to see if I can get it to do it again. Okay, but anyways, the follower can get caught up inside this lid. I just got it to do it earlier, right? But 
one of the ways they, they tried to combat that was to create a higher spring pressure. Okay, shoot, if, if the first strike rounds aren't gonna dimple and if there's a potential uh, uh, situation where they might cash, having a stiffer spring rate will push that round past that catching point. But the problem, guys, is that you cannot create enough spring pressure to, to alleviate that issue, okay? What you need to do is create a better magazine, okay? And so, you know, even though the D mags came out with stiffer springs to work better with first strike rounds, these edges here on the opening, the first strike rounds will still catch on the little sliding trap door. It'll still catch on the rough edges of the first strike round cutout. Okay, and that's very true with the Helix mags, right? Because the Helix mags, once again, guys, you gotta remember that MCS designed these mags to work with both rounds. And so, if they were going to make a stiffer spring for the Helix mags, because it's a continuous fed magazine, that's gonna put more pressure on round balls, which would make the Helix mags not work well with round balls. And so that's the reason why they kind of even to their website today, you look at their website, it literally clearly states, use the Helix mags for round ball only and use the D mags for first strike rounds if you go and change out the springs on them, right? But like I tell you guys, it's just a band-aid because the cutouts are still very, unfortunately, rough. It's gonna make the FS rounds catch. And no, no amount of spring pressure Okay, and I'll show you that to get it here. here. Go, go and compare, you know, if you guys have multiple magazines like I do here, right? Okay, so I have this magazine here loaded, let me see which one. Okay, this magazine right here is loaded with the first strike round springs. This magazine right here is just loaded with your standard round springs. This one's very soft, guys. Totally can see what they're talking about. Okay, this one's a lot stiffer. I'll give it that. It's a lot stiffer, okay? But it's nowhere near as stiff as a T15 magazine spring, and it's nowhere near as stiff as an M17 magazine spring, right? So if these magazines, the M17 and the T15, can work well with round ball, especially if you're using the right round balls, right, like Valken or something like that, yes, they're gonna be less reliable. That's the reason why the D mags are a little bit more reliable than these other magazines with round ball because of the spring pressure, right? but they're not gonna work well with first strike rounds, right? So and there's, there's always a compromise in engineering, right? You make one thing work for one thing, you're kind of compromising the functionality and working operation of another. And of course I have the 20 round magazines here too, guys. I think at one point they also did make a 30 round magazine, but it was just not really worth it too long and not too many players liked that look, but you know, even with the stiffer spring pressure here, it's not the spring pressure. So I think that's a very false, that's the reason, another reason why I love making these videos is I want to debunk all these false myths. The spring pressure, although it is an aspect of first strike functionality and reliability, it's not the only thing. And so if you don't have a good magazine feed design, magazine uh, you know, build design, the spring pressure isn't going to help it. Now, one thing I did like about the uh, the D Mag, they are very similar to the M17, and you guys can kind of see it here if I somehow can show you guys. But you can notice that the followers are very similar, right? It has kind of that EMF 100 follower shape. Right, where it has like a cutout, a cup shape, where the first strike round can sit on there properly, uh, compared to the first strike rounds. You'll notice the first strike round has kind of this round follower, which, guys, T15, first strike, whoever owns them now, please fix that, or maybe someone that comes out with a 3D printed design, please fix that, because this would make the T15 magazines so much more reliable. It's this round follower which causes the first strike round to, you know, pivot or, or uh, you know, just kind of cock inside the magazine, which could cause the jams and the flips that 
that the T15 magazines are uh, capable of, right? Whereas this correct follower design, like the M17 and the DMAG and the EMF, is the correct follower design. So yeah, guys, I mean, like I said, hopefully this helps all 468 users out there, potential users, new players going into the, uh, the MagFed game. That's the pros and cons, all the different features of the 468 that our team was used. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing a couple things when it comes to servicing the, the blowback system in the 468, but for the most part, in terms of the overall general functions that you're gonna run into in a day-to-day -day gameplay, those are the issues with it. They work well, DMAGs work well, conversion kits work well with round ball, but it's not a first strike capable marker. Now, why is the 468 Scout a potential first strike marker? Is because of the fact that you're literally hand loading each round, right? So any issues that you might have with the DMAG speeding mechanism, you can potentially uh, divert it, right? Because hey, if you go to load a round and oh shoot, I feel something jamming, it doesn't feel like the first strike round was loaded correctly, I feel like there's, you know, maybe it flipped, you can stop what you're doing, eject the magazine and fix and clear the issue, right? But in a semi-automatic marker, Right, you pull, you press the trigger, bam, it goes shoot that one first strike round, but if the next one doesn't load properly, the bolt's gonna come forward and come potentially cause an issue, right? Uh, or if, like you said, if the lock bolt system has a pair. Anyways, a semi-bolt action marker doesn't allow that leeway, right? So that's kind of where the 468 DMR uh, would be a better uh, candidate for first strike round usage. Okay, guys, hey, hopefully this uh, this video was helpful, informative. Hopefully it helps you guys out there. Guys, uh, please, you know, like this video, subscribe to the channel. And, guys, I'll check you guys next time. Peace.